Hello, my name is the Honorable Lady Lynn Fairchild. However, most people in the Society for Creative Anachronism know me as Linnea. I will answer to either name. And for today, I wanted to explain a little bit about blackwork embroidery and introduce you to it. I've been studying blackwork embroidery for well over 18 years at this point. Um, I've been doing it uh, since I was about 16 years old. So welcome to my class today. So welcome to my introduction on blackwork embroidery. Blackwork embroidery originally it dated back to about the ninth century for radiocarbon analysis of existing examples in museums. It may have been around earlier than that, but the ninth century is the earliest examples that we can find. And blackwork embroidery is actually from Egypt. It's Egyptian embroidery. It was done in a counted thread technique, usually with two threads using a double running stitch with a largely geometric plant and animal motifs. Now, a quick side note, this double running stitch, you will see it when you do research, you will find it as Mamluk embroidery, a whole bind stitch, double running stitch. It could be black work, it might also be listed as red work. That just depends on what color of thread you're using. Lots of different names, all the same type of embroidery. It's meant to look like it's reversible. I know in Tudor, um, in Tudor embroidery, it tends to be more circular and looks or is supposed to resemble lace, but we'll get into more of that later. The Moors and the Mamluks were Muslims and they were originally part of the Umayyad Caliphate. A caliphate, it's an Islamic state led by someone like a priest king, both a religious and a political leader over a territory. The Islamic world expanded and eventually ruled over Northern Africa, including Egypt, and later in the Iberian Peninsula, including Spain um, in the year 711. Now here are a couple of examples of Egyptian blackwork. On the left, you will see an example from about 1250, and that's at the Victoria and Albert Museum in England. And on the right is also from about 1250, and also at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Now, if you look at both examples, you will see there are lots of geomet geometric shapes, lots of right angles, linear lines. It's very, very geometric, and this is very typical of the Egyptian black work. Here are a few more examples. On the left is an example from the 14th century, and that is in the Ashmolean Museum. And then the sampler on the right is also 14th century, and that is at the Victorian Albert Museum. The thing I like about, well, what, the one on the left, to me, it looks like designs for a sampler, like what you would expect to find, maybe a design on a shirt cuff. Whereas the designs on the right are more interesting. Like if you look on the bottom right corner, to me, it almost looks like a cat wearing a crown. Now, during the 11th and 12th centuries, um, these are this map shows you the trade routes. And if you look in the bottom sort of right corner, you will see Alexandria, Cairo, and a couple other cities in that area. That's all from Egypt. But if you look, they're also connected all through Northern Africa and also going up and over into Europe, into Italy. And from the Northern um, African route, they went up into Spain. So from Spain and Italy, Egypt was able to, I guess you could say, infiltrate Europe with its trade. Now, as I mentioned before, European black work, if you look on the right hand side, uh, this is an example of late Tudor period black work. And as you can see, instead of having the geometric designs that Egyptian black work has, the Tudor 
black work actually has more circular floral motifs. So through the Moorish occupation of Spain from 711 to 1492 and the Mamluk trade routes in Italy, black work embroidery became popular and spread throughout Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. So Egyptian black work went, started as early as the 9th century and went till about the 14th, 15th centuries. And by that point, it had caught on in Europe and then was very popular in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. Here are more examples of black work embroidery. On the left-hand side, you will see Bess of Hardwick sleeves from about 1550. And if you notice, it's not black. Remember how I mentioned earlier about red work? Red work is Holbein stitch done in red rather than black red. On the right hand side are Jane Seymour's cuffs from about 1636. And as you can see, it's painted by Hans Holbein, which is where you get the name the Holbein stitch because Hans Holbein specifically was really good about painting different portraits with the black work detail. In fact, he painted miniatures that have the black work detail. And it's so detailed that when you blow up the miniature on your computer and you blow up the image, you can actually sit there and count the threads and recreate the pattern from a little miniature portrait. Personally, I think that's pretty cool. As a side note, in case you're curious who Jane Seymour is, Jane Seymour was the third wife of King Henry VIII. She's the one who died in childbirth about, what, a little over a year after marrying Henry VIII. So what is black work? Black work is a reversible embroidery stitch, usually done with silk thread on linen. Over the centuries, as I mentioned before, Black work has also been referred to as Holbein stitch, back stitch, Spanish work, festoon stitch, square stitch, or double running stitch. Or it's also known as Mamluk embroidery. By counting the threads, the double running stitch is a series of two journeys. On the first journey, the pattern is to work every other stitch. And with that, you will get an in out, in out, in out pattern. Then on the return journey, you fill in all of the blank spots to create one continuous line. So on the return journey, you will go in, out, in, out, in, out, and the finished product looks like a single line. What materials do you need? A slate frame is historically accurate. However, if you want to use just a, a round frame, not historically accurate, but it's still, you can still work with it. Or you can also use a scroll frame. I personally advise not to do the scroll frame, but that's just personal preference. I've tried a scroll frame before and had difficulty keeping my tension. If you use a circular hoop frame, the problem with that is again with your tension as you move the hoop frame across your fabric, you tend to warp the linen a bit and then it makes your stitches uneven. Next after the frame you need linen fabric. Black work could have been done on other fabrics such as velvet but it was primarily done on linen. Also you need silk thread. There were other types of threads used such as cotton but very rarely, and I've actually tried using cotton thread before and found it to be quite difficult. The silk thread, if you have a knot in your thread one way, you just pull the knot in the opposite direction and the knot comes right out. It's very easy to work with and it's very pretty depending on if you get twisted or untwisted silk thread, you can have an extra shine to it. The cotton thread, I found just if it got twisted up, it got knotted, it was difficult to get the knot out, and it's not as pretty, in my personal opinion. So you've got your slate frame, your fabric, your thread, you also need a needle. Beeswax is optional, 
but I highly recommend it, at least for the ends of your threads, to help your thread not fray. And you need to decide on the pattern. What is a slate frame? A slate frame is just simply a box frame where you stitch your fabric in the middle of the frame. And it helps keep the tension on all four sides. If you look on my on the page here, on the left hand side, you will see an example of silk embroidery being done in 1568. And that's a German picture there. In the middle is what a slate frame looks like today. And on the right hand side is a, a painting by Francesco Casa from about the late 1400s. And again, you can see the slate frame, but also if you look, it looks like there's legs on the slate frame, so it could be used almost like a table. What type of needle do you use? If you look on the left-hand side, there's an enhanced portrait of Costanza, I'll probably mispronounced this, and please correct me if I do mispronounce this, Costanza Cantani. And that's also from the late 1400s. And in that portrait, you see her with pins, a thimble, and sewing needle. For my black work, I usually just typically use the same type of needle like what you would use in today's modern cross stitch. But that's what I use. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see Viking era needles, and that's from Coppergate. The one thing you have to make sure of is if the eye of your needle is larger than the pointy end of your needle, then that might warp the linen a bit. So you want a needle that is about as straight as possible where the eye is not any bigger than the rest of the needle. That way it doesn't warp the thread at all and create or warp your fabric at all and create holes in your fabric. You also want to use a very thin needle for the same reason. What type of silk thread? I recommend using, and I'll probably mispronounce this, soy perle. This is a twisted silk thread that only needs beeswax applied to the ends of the threads. There is also the soy oval. If I mis mispronounce that, please let me know. And the soy oval is an untwisted silk thread. This thread is shinier than the soy perle, but it also frays a lot more. I can show you examples of that later in this class. So the soy oval is shinier and prettier looking, but with that one, you really want to use the beeswax on it because it will fray and the backside, it will look, <laughs> look like a mess after a while. For Egyptian threads, blue, red, and brown, the brown could be faded black for common embroidery threads used pre in pre six, sorry, pre 15th century Egypt embroidery. The brown threads that we see in examples and museums may have originally been black since the iron used to dye the threads can fade over time as well as erode the thread. Black silk thread on white linen was definitely the most popular and the most favored in Europe. Red thread was occasionally used, as we saw previously, in Bess of Hardwick sleeves. In England, gold and silver threads were also used. However, a person had to be careful when using gold or silver threads due to the sumptuary laws. Among the restrictions listed in Elizabeth I's 1574 statute was that for gold, silver, or pearl embroidery, it was reserved for only dukes, marquises, earls, including the children of all three, viscounts, barons, and knights of the garter. Here's an example of a woman's Italian shirt from the late 16th century. This example is in the Textile Museum in Prado. And one of the things that I find neat about this shirt is not only is there black work on the cuffs and around the collar, but it's also going up the sleeves. If you look where the sleeves join the shirt, 
there on that seam, there's black work embroidery on all of the seams. So where there are gores on the sides, down the front and on the sides, going towards the bottom hem, there's more black work on all of the seams. I think it helps give it character. I love it. Can Gooderman silk thread be used? Gooderman silk thread can be purchased at Joanne Fabrics or any local fabric store. It's machine washable and it's a nice thread to begin learning black work on, especially if you can buy it cheaply with a coupon. I know Joanne Fabrics a lot of times has like a 40% off coupon, which makes the Gooderman silk thread ideal in as a, a learning tool. Plus it's machine washable. If, for example, if you look on the bottom right in that picture, those are cups I made for my son's shirt when he was, I believe, four years old. He was still able to fit in that shirt when he turned six, and he did youth combat in the SCA wearing that shirt. Now you can just imagine how much sweat and dirt went into that linen shirt that he wore. And because I used Guterman silk thread on that shirt, I was able to machine wash it and keep it white, amazingly. However, as far as using Guterman silk thread or not using Guterman silk thread, if you're aiming for historical accuracy or you want a more bold thread, then I would not recommend using this. The Guterman silk thread tends to be very thin and so you can see it up close, you know, to see the pattern, but as you step away, you cannot see the person's pattern as easily because it is very thin and also like I said, for historical accuracy, you would want a bold thread. That way, when you're standing more than six feet away from someone, they can still see the embroidery and actually see the pattern, and then they can compliment you on, wow, look at that pattern. What items were embroidered? The Moorish embroidery had been used to decorate various household items, such as towels, napkins, and cushion covers as well as garments such as robes and veils. In Europe, clothes were embroidered, such as shirt sleeves, ruffs, cuffs, coifs, doublets, nightcaps, falling bands, along with handkerchiefs. Part of this was to do embroidery, it takes a lot of time, especially if you are doing black work embroidery on sleeves, on the fourth part of a skirt. That takes a lot of time. And so they like to wear their wealth. And if you can afford to just simply sit there and do embroidery all day, then that means you have lots of luxury. You have extra time on your hands. And so aside from your pearls, your velvets, your furs, depending on your station, you would also show off the black work embroidery. What about a pattern? On the left-hand side is a 16th century Italian sa sampler from the Victorian Albert Museum. And with this sampler, I have, um, I will put the link in the description below, but there is a website out there and they have, I believe it is 25 to 30 patterns that have been recreated from this sampler. And then on the right-hand side is Jane Bostock's English sampler from 1598, and that is also at the Victorian Albert Museum. One of the nice things with using a sampler is you can sit and pick out which pattern you want to use for your particular item. So if you want to embroider cuffs, I can look at this and I could recreate that specific pattern, or I can use it as inspiration while creating my own pattern. Now, if you're just starting out, I suggest to start with a simple pattern. On the top left-hand side is a pattern from Egypt. It's about circa 13th or 14th century. It is blue silk on linen. I believe it's unbleached linen. And if you look, it's just got a simple line on top, and then right below that is another simple line. And then a little zigzaggy pattern going from the top left, zigzag 
on the diagonal to the bottom right, and then two more straight lines underneath that. Fairly simple as far as black work patterns go. On the right hand side is Nicholas Bessé's new model book pattern, um, which is German. It's from a 1568. And with this pattern, it just looks like crosses, one right after the other. Again, fairly simple. With this pattern, unlike the one on the left, the Nicholas Bessé's pattern, you can use probably using just one thread. So you would just go on your first journey, left to right, and then on your return journey, going right to left, and your pattern's done. On the bottom is the portrait of a lady as St. Lucy by Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio. It's from about 1509, and that's at the, sorry if I mispronounced this, Bissen Bornemisma Museo Nacional in Madrid, Spain. And as far as black work embroidery, I think this is the most simple pattern. If you look right on the edge of her collar, beneath the necklace, you'll see the necklace, it's a little bit of skin, and then the square neckline of her dress. And right on the edge of that square neckline is a single dashed line. About as simple as you can get for black work. So how do you begin? First, you want to weave your thread in and out, typically through the fabric. I shouldn't say typically, sorry. Going ahead of myself. Yes, so first you want to weave your thread in and out through the fabric. Typically, I work left to right and I count approximately every third or fifth hole per stitch in the linen fabric. Later, I can show you the differences between every third hole and every fifth hole because that will then determine how small or how big your pattern is. And once you are at the end of the line, then the return journey begins and that's where you fill in the spaces. And then when you are done, you want to weave the tail of the thread into the pattern on the underneath side. You also do this at the very beginning when you start off. So when you start off, you'll have a little bit of the tail on the underneath side, and you'll just weave it into the pattern as you go left to right, and then return, and then the end of your thread gets woven in at the same place your tail was. If you're in the middle of a pattern, you might be able to split it part on the left, part on the right, but I can get into more of that later. Another option is to tie a knot at the end of your thread. However, if you do tie a knot, there are a couple of issues you may want to know about. One, depending on how big or how small you tie your knot, if it's small and you machine wash your fabric, that knot may pull through the fabric and now you've lost part of your pattern. The other thing is if you want your pattern to be completely reversible on both sides, depending on how many stitches your pattern was, where your knot is may not be at the exact starting place as where your thread started. So on the underneath side, you might have a knot here and a knot here and a space in between where there should be another stitch. Again, personal preference, I have known some people to knot their threads and they like to do it. I just recommend testing out and see what works for you. On the picture here, you will see at the very top, the pattern is that simple line that I mentioned on the last screen. That was on the square neckline. It's just a single line. And so to start off, here you have the dashed look of in, out, in, out, in, out. And then when you get to the end of your whatever it is you're embroidering, the end of your cuff, collar, whatever, then you start your return journey, and now you go back right to left, back to where you began. And again, you do the in, out, in, out pattern, and in the end, you have a complete picture. So again, what do you do with the end of your thread? On the far left-hand side, you can see where I had just done a quick sampler, and on that sampler, I was testing out different silk threads 
the very top thread is the Gunnerman silk thread. And then the middle, I believe that one was the untwisted silk thread. And then the third one down was the twisted silk thread. That's the differences between the soy oval and the soy perlé. But I was also testing out the differences between beeswax on all of the thread, just on the tail ends, or no beeswax at all. That's why there's three sections of three. But for my quick sampler, you can see where I just, I wove the tail ends into the underneath side of the pattern. If you want to try to be a little more neat in the center section or the center picture, it's the back side of a sampler by Elizabeth Burton, about 1701. So I know that's out of the time period for the SCA because we only go up to the 16th century. But anyways, um, the back side of this sampler, it's from 1701. It's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But as you can see, there are, you can see where some of the tail ends are, but for the most part to me, this looks fairly neat and pretty. On the right hand side is a collar I had done, and that is with the soy oval silk thread. And with that, there's no beeswax on the tail ends of the fabric or on the thread. And that's where I learned the hard way to use beeswax on the tail ends of your thread. After you've embroidered your piece, After you've embroidered your piece, then attach it to your garment. On the left-hand side, you will see where I embroidered the cuffs and the collar for a shirt, and then I cut it off of the slate frame, and I attached it to a shirt for my husband. Do you want a challenge? Try doing reversible cross-stitch. This is a 16th century shirt. It's at the v &A Museum, and I can, um, Put the link below for more information. But with this, this collar, the cuffs, everything, it's reversible cross stitch, which if you look at reversible cross stitch is black work embroidery, just done in little X's all over the shirt. Now before how I mentioned a slate frame for your embroidery, here's my pieces for a slate frame. I did a video about three years ago on how to dress a slate frame. And looking back at it, it's on YouTube, but it's pixelized and the angle isn't very good. So keep an eye out. I plan on doing an updated video on how to dress your slate frame. And when I mentioned the differences between Guterman silk thread versus like the soy oval or the soy perle, this is just to show you, this is what Guterman silk thread looks like. So it's blue. Um, blue plastic and then very thin silk thread. The soy oval and the soy perle, this is how they're sold. As I mentioned before, you can use the circular hoops. Just be cautious because it will warp your th linen thread a bit. So once you're done embroidering, I suggest taking your thread off of the hoop and giving it a chance to rest and try to move the thread a bit so that way it doesn't work as much. Remember that sampler where I mentioned the differences between using beeswax and not using beeswax and the differences between the Guterman silk thread and the soy oval and the soy perle? Here is that sampler. So if you look this is the Guterman silk thread and then the untwisted and then the twisted silk thread and then this section has no beeswax. This section just has beeswax on the end. And then this one, it has beeswax throughout. But like as I move back, you can see the twisted and the untwisted are still pretty bold. Whereas the Guterman silk thread is starting to fade away because, well, it's a thin thread. The differences between the third hole and every fifth hole, this is a sampler. It, remember that 16th century Italian sampler I talked about? These are patterns from that sampler. And if you look, oh, I'm on the back side too. 
you look, this is every third hole on the whole sampler. This is a coif I made for my daughter, and I believe it has 88 diamonds. Each diamond with a flower in the middle took me about 20 minutes to do, and this is every fifth hole. So to show you the size difference, this is every fifth hole on the flower, and this one on the left is every third hole. So that's the differences between the sizing. So if you're doing something small like a collar or a cuff, I recommend doing every third hole. You will find it's also easier to weave your tail in back into the fa fabric on the underneath side if you do every third hole. If you're doing something larger like sleeves or the forepart to a skirt, you probably want to do every fifth hole, otherwise you'll be at it all day long. As far as whether to do every third hole, every fifth hole on historical accuracy, I think that was just more or less personal preference because a lot of the patterns that we look at that we can find are in portraits, such as Holbein's portraits. And we can find the pattern, we can recreate the pattern, but we can't tell just by looking at the painting if it's every third hole or every fifth hole. Remember how I mentioned learning the hard way about using beeswax, at least on the ends of your silk threads? On the Gooderman silk thread, you don't need the beeswax, but if you use the soy valve or the soy perle or any other silk thread like that, you'll want to use beeswax at least on the end. Here is a partlet that I stitched, and on the underneath side is the untwisted without any beeswax. And in sections of it, you can start to see where it's fraying. Let me see if that zooms in. So you can see where it's fraying right there. So again, use the beeswax. Remember how I mentioned the Italian sampler that was from the 16th century and that there were patterns available online? Let me show you that website. So go to Dragon Lore. I believe it's dragonlore.net. Yep. And then as you scroll down, right here in the middle of the page, it says where 25 of these patterns have been created. So just click on that 25 and you will see the different patterns there or at the very top, right underneath the paragraph, you'll see where it says printer friendly PDF version. So you can print this out. I believe it's three pages worth. There are other patterns out there, other samplers. For example, I have plenty on my Pinterest page. As you can see here on my Pinterest page here, just look up Tudor Blackwork Embroidery. I've got more than just the Tudor Blackwork. I also have Egyptian on here, or any other Blackwork I can find. But here are a variety of patterns. For example, here in the middle of the screen is the pattern for the Bess of Hardwick sleeves. and more Egyptian black work. And also to give you suggestions and ideas for other things you can do for black work would be like a chalice veil or a chalice cover. And that's great for when like you go to SCA events, you want something to display your black work and also keep bugs out of your drink. You want to create a chalice veil. Or another thing, um, I've made one, but on the left-hand side, you will see there's a needle book tutorial on that. The needle books were not period. I believe those didn't come around until like the late 19th century, but it's still a way to not only keep track of your needles, but also be able to display your black work embroidery capabilities. And then next to that picture right here is more um, more historical samplers um, with the patterns and more examples of black work. If you want more information on the history of black work embroidery as well as more samples and portraits with black work embroidery in it, please visit my blog at tutorblackwork.blogspot.com. I have been doing this research on my blog for about six years now. 
and there's lots of information, lots of patterns. Please feel free to check it out. Also, if you're on Facebook, please check out my page. It's Tudor Blackwork Embroidery. And on there, I've got a couple of videos as well as many posts and pictures of blackwork. Here you can see different examples of different patterns from English, Italian, and Egyptian. Here I also have portraits. This, for example, is a portrait of the Countess of Warwick from 1565. And as you can see, she's got black work on her collar as well as her sleeves. And then right beside her, there's also another painting here. And in this portrait, you can see she has black work pretty much throughout her outfit along the sleeves, the partlet along the, the collar right underneath the partlet, as well as the forefront of her bodice and also the forefront of her skirt. If you have questions, I have a whole binder of documentation that I've been collecting over the years. I also have a, a collection of 16th century German patterns that was interpreted by Claudette Zeman. It's based on the patterns from Nicholas Basset's new model book from 1568 and Hans Hofer's form book line from 1545. However, I've tried looking on the internet and I can't find the source now. If you see here on the ElizabethanCostume.net page, it says that German blackwork patterns are temporarily unavailable. So if you have questions regarding the patterns for this, please let me know. Please keep an eye out for my upcoming video. I'm going to be updating a video on how to dress a slate frame. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, comment below, and subscribe.